So I'll just take a few minutes, uh, a few seconds, I should say, not minutes, um, to welcome you in as the attendees are joining us, our audience members. We have decided to show you all of us here today uh, be behind the scenes where we'll be participating in the event. So you're seeing this gallery view right now, seeing everybody here today. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to all the panelists, all of our young readers. Welcome to the audience members. As you settle into this webinar, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, First of all, we're super pleased that uh, Dr. Anne Louise Davidson has brought this project to us. Uh, we're very excited to take part in the soft launch of Amber the Maker, which is a story that stems from cutting edge research developed by Professor Anne Louise Davidson, who's also the Concordia University Research Chair in Maker Culture. So thank you, Anne Louise. Thank you to all of our young readers, parents, guardians, and the special guests that are joining Anne Louise today. So I'll pass the mic to her to tell you more about it. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the reading of Amber the Maker. Um, perhaps I guess one of the most important aspects of what I do is to help people figure out the impossible. And that's exactly why I created Amber's character. Um, what, I do, what I love the most about what I do is that I always work in a team. And this is why I asked Elizabeth, who is Iliad's and Ayla's mother, and my student at the time, to write uh, the story with me. I also asked Alina, who is joining us today, and she's also Amelia's mother, who will open uh, the, the, the reading, to illustrate the story. And you will see later why I think that these are both extraordinary people. Today we have 30 children from Canada, the United States, the Bahamas, England, and Lebanon, who have volunteered to take part in reading Amber the Maker. Our youngest participant is five years old, the youngest live participant today is six years old, and the oldest is 13. The students from L'Ecole du Triolet are on their way home, but they pre-recorded their part, and we have their principal, Marc-André Girard, with us. Some children are already in bed, so they have pre-recorded their part as well. You will notice a colorful mosaic of ways in which children are reading. For some, it's a story to read at school in their English as a second language class. Others are reading it as a bedtime story. Some children are reading their, with their older siblings, while others are reading it to their younger siblings. Some children change their voice as, they, as if they were acting in a play. And some who are too young to read can listen to the story, look at the images, and ask questions. You will notice that some are reading from the book, while others are reading from a printed page or a tablet. There are many ways to read a story and interact with the characters, and that's what we'll see today. So before I hand it over to the children who are impatiently waiting to read, Dr. Pascal Sicat, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science at Concordia University, will proceed with a land acknowledgement and opening remarks. Anne Louise, merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to be here today and to see all these wonderful faces on the screen. Um, I'm very proud to be here. This is a very, very special event. So if you allow me, I will start by making the land acknowledgement, the traditional land acknowledgement, which, which is a moment for us to reflect on what it means to our where we are. We're all in, in a location and here, many of us are in Montreal and Montreal um, is a land where Concordia is located on this on this land, which is an unceded indigenous uh, land, and the Kanyahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and the waters. That means they're they're the the the, the stewards, they're the keepers um, of this land and the waters on which we gather today. They've traditionally looked after this land. Jojage, which is a name, another name for Montreal, the original name for Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many, many First Nations. And it's important for us to remember this as we think about the past, as we think about the present, and as we also project ourselves in the future. This is important for us to think about our ongoing relationships with the Indigenous peoples and the other peoples who live here in the Montreal community. So, Amber the Maker, that's a wonderful, wonderful project. This is uh, educational, this is inspirational, and this is also an introduction to this world of the maker culture. 
uh, as are this is very very formal my words here are very formal and i and i know it may not be fun for many of you guys but i i that's my job as a dean to do that so just give me a couple of minutes as our Concordia University Research Chair in Maker Culture, Tier 2, Professor Davidson is very familiar with Maker Culture and the potential that, make, that Maker spaces hold. So we all know that research scientists can publish their work in scientific journals, in books, um, but what this book project makes us think about is that there are many ways to transfer the knowledge that we gain through research, but push the boundaries of knowledge of knowledge further, but by making it accessible in different ways. And so Amber the Maker is an example on how to um, take complex issues, complex concepts, and and allow children to read about it and 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 to move forward with those. One thing this, that is particularly interesting about this book is that it is, it is an example of people bringing different fields together, what we call interdisciplinarity. And this is something our faculty, the Faculty of Arts and Science, does a lot every day. And so I'm very proud about this. So through this initiative, uh, through other initiatives like the Research Chairs Program, other places like the Milieu Institute, and also Fourth Space today, which is hosting this virtual event, we can see examples of research collaborations um, across uh, our university. So in gathering so many students and parents together today, Anne-Louise, Elizabeth and Alina have worked with Fort Space to create a very special launch event for this book. You all know, because you've read it, that at its heart, this is a story about inclusion and this is what we want to remember. To any student who struggles to feel a sense of belonging, know that Concordia is a welcoming place and we would be pleased to welcome you one day. Happy reading. Thank you, Dr. Sikat. Um, so it's time and uh, let's get going. So the first person who is opening the book is um, Emilio. And uh, I will just share my desktop so that you can hear him. I think I made a mistake. I was the first one to make a mistake. Good job. Okay. And now we're going to read Emerald and Maker. <laughs> All right, it's um, Elliot's turn. Amber lost her arm wrestling a crocodile, or at least that's what she told people when she was little. Her dad says Amber always has had a very active imagination. Okay, Amber's just just before Ayla, uh, I made a mistake uh, with the the, the page turning. So maybe we can we can show the image. Uh, I don't know who can spotlight the book cam image. Violet is turning pages for us. Thank you so much. So that's the first picture. Violet, can you turn to the second picture? There we go. Okay, Ayla's turn. Amber is now eight years old. She must have truth is that Amber was born with her right arm that stopped below the elbow. Page three, Zachary's turn. Amber never missed having a hand on her right arm. She is able to do everything other children can do, but sometimes she needs a bit more time. Sometimes she needs the help of a prosthetic device. It's Tristan's turn. No. No. Amber has an everyday prosthetic and a sport prosthetic. Her sport prosthetic is neat because she can attach different hands for different activities. 
Amber has just joined the swim team and is excited to try out her new swimming hand. Next page, Violet. And that's Olivia's turn. Today is Amber's first swimming practice. The coach blows his whistle and the first racers in each line step onto the starting platform. The coach blows his whistle again and the first racers splash into the pool. Lana is very fast. She beats all the other racers back to the platform. When Amber's turn comes, her team is far ahead of the others. So that's Charlotte's turn. Something is wrong. Each time Amber lifts her prosthetic hand out of the water, it feels too heavy. Amber can hear the other girls calling out to her. Amber finishes last. Uh, she made us all, uh, she made us lose. She is way too slow. I knew that having an MQT on our swim team is, was a bad idea. Lena says. Lena. So the video is not working on my end. Just give me a second. Here we go. What's wrong, sweet pea? Ask Amber dad when he pick her from swim practice. Nothing, I just don't want to go swim practice ever, ever again, say Amber. That's too bad. Swimming, cool, my fire. Mumble, gentling. Who are you, says Amber. I am gentling. Are, are you a dragon? Yes, but don't worry. I won't hurt you. Are hair hair? You say you never went to swim again, and I doubt a cold help you. Humber noticed that Jetling has a protective foreleg. What's happening to your foreleg? Did you fight a crocodile? Amber has. Jetling responds, ha, 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 ha. That is the funniest story I ever had. I was born this way. My mom said I was a special dragon. It was okay when I was little, but then I grew up. All the other dragons played, and I was no hobble to follow. <clears throat> I often felt frustrated and hurt. Amber responded, Yes, I know, harder can be mine. Do you want to come home with me? I show you my room. Amber arrived home, ran to her rooms and slammed the door. She stuck her swimming hands out of her bag and threw it into garbage. Amber mother comes into her room and sees her prosthetics into the garbage. Oh, Amber, why did you do that? It doesn't it work. Mom, it only makes me slower. I don't want it anymore. I didn't it work this time, but we can make adjustment. Why don't we... Take it back to your prosthetics. 
Don't worry, we will find the right swimming. And for you, Amber, you just have to be patient. Gentling and Amber decide to search for a better swimming end on the internet. They read a news story about a man who used a 3D printer to make a prostitute to hold his kayak paddle. This gives Amber an idea. Amber learns that she can use a 3D printer at some libraries and at some cool place called Maker Spaces. Amber asks her parents to take her to a Maker Space. Are you Amber? Amber nods. My name is Goodfinger and this is Anne Louise. I am a maker who helps makers. Your mom told me you want to learn about 3D printing. I would love to show you all about it. Will you like to make something today? I want to make a prosthetic hand to help me swim, says Amber. Well, says Goodfinger, why don't we start with something smaller? Goodfinger says, open a web browser and type www.thingersgivers.com. Type C A R G H O L G E R in the search bar. Cool, can we print this one? Amber asks. Let's look at it together. This one looks like it lies flat on the table. Is this what you want? Would you like to modify it? Mm, let's see. I think I would like it a uh, a bit higher, says Amber. Amber, what if you added spacers under this card holder? This could raise it a bit and you could see your cards better, says her father. Yes, and you could stick rubber pads under it to prevent it from sliding on the table, says her mother. That's Mohammed's page. Goodfinger says it will take over an hour to print this card holder. Let's watch it for the first few layers and then we can do other things as it prints. We will still need to watch it every few minutes. To be safe, we never leave printers unattended. And that's Hisham's page. Maybe Hisham got logged out. Well, maybe we can read that page together then. Ready? Does anybody want to volunteer for reading the page or do I go ahead? Let me go. And Louise says, Amber, if you want to design your own prosthetic, you will need to learn how to operate this 3D printer. You need to learn to prepare it, make mistakes and fix them. Let me show you how to do a paper test to adjust the nozzle. I'm ready, says Amber. Amber wears safety goggles to prevent her eyes, eyes and heat resistant gloves to 
to avoid getting burnt because 3D printers get very hot. The ideal scenario would be to involve your pro theaters. I suggest we start with some drafts and plan a meeting with all of us. We can create prototypes with 3D printing filament we have in the makerspace. When we are ready to print the final version, we can order filament made with sturdier materials. We're just gonna break for a second. We got a little bit of a page Amber. turning. Okay, go for it. Amber leaves the market space with the card holder. She successfully printed. Her mind is filled with ideas for her 3D printed <laughs> prosthetic swimming head. Awesome. Good job. Okay. And now for more of the pre recordings. Mrs. Fitwell, Amber's prosthetist says I think this swimming prosthetic can work, but you will need to improve the design for the terminal attachment bolt. I will leave you some information about how much resistance and strength you can handle in the water. Okay, Amber? In the weeks that follow, Amber and our parents visit the makerspace many times. Amber is excited to try her new prosthetic as swim practice. She puts it on. She notices that her new swimming hand is much lighter than her old one. Do some racing to practice for the upcoming meet, says the coach. Lana looks over at Amber. Hey, Slowpoke. Haven't seen you in a while. I thought you quit. I don't quit, responds Amber, and I'll show you I'm no Slowpoke. On your marks, get set, go, shouts the coach. Amber dives into the pool. Her prosthetic hand moves easily through the water. Amber swims as fast as she can. I arrived, I arrived first, screamed Amber with joy. I'm sorry I was mean to you before. I just didn't want to lose at the swim meet because of a slowpoke. But I guess I was a slowpoke today. Can you forgive me, says Lana. Amber looks at her and smiles. Yes, I forgive you. Great, your new prosthetic hand is pretty cool. Thanks, I made it myself, says Amber. Wow, that is so neat, says Lana. Hey, can I ask you something? Yeah, go ahead, Amber answers. How did you lose your hand? Well, it's a pretty interesting story, says Amber. <laughs> That's it. Good job, guys. Bravo. So impressive. We succeeded together. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Elizabeth and Alina just to get some of the narratives about uh, this story and 
maybe I can just ask you when I when I came up with the idea of Amber the Maker, did you did you ever think we'd land here today <laughs> with this uh, with this event? I guess the first one that that, that got it was um, they received the idea was Elizabeth at the time. Uh, Elizabeth was my student, and I said, why don't, why don't we write the story together? So Elizabeth, maybe uh, did you want to uh, to talk a little bit about how we we came to write the book? Um, so when you contacted me, I was very excited about the idea because we've had so many challenges that you and I had uh, had talked about in the past with with finding the right uh, prosthetics for Elliot and uh, working on so many different versions of prosthetics and really trying to find the right fit, the right material, the right weight. So it was something that that spoke to me and the the idea of someone being um, of a kid being empowered to create something themselves that was really uh, driven and directed by what they needed and uh, having that voice was so important. So um, as some of you have probably noticed, my son Elliot here uh, is an amputee, just like Amber. So this story, when Anne Louise reached out to me and, and wanted to collaborate, I was so excited to be able to share a little bit of his story and his thoughts and our struggles together um, through this story. So I was really excited to, to take part in writing it. And I'm very glad we are where we are today and uh, so happy to hear you guys reading it so well. So one of the things that I need to mention is that, you know, the, the whole opening of the book, which is Amber lost her arm uh, fighting a crocodile is, is really Elliot's idea. So kudos to you, Elliot. That's a wonderful imagination. Do you still tell that story today? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> I have a few different stories that I tell. <laughs> he has a few different stories, he said. So when we write a story, it's one thing to have the story and then, and then to write it and test it out and see if people understand it and if we're saying it the way we really meant it. Because sometimes you have an idea in your head and you want to tell the story and then other people are saying, well, it's not clear. So there's some work to be done back and forth to get the story to really be what we want to say. But then after that, there's a big part of the story, which is how to make it come to life through characters and through illustrations. And this is why I approached Alina, who will tell her part of the story because she's my best illustrator. Thank you. Um, for me, the, the, the project has been an amazing project. Like I, I say it's a project that has heart and soul. Um, it was just such an honor to bring these characters to life and tell such an inspirational story with visuals. So I have Amber in like all kinds of like stickers and <laughs> printouts and we don't have the book yet at home, but it is a story that for a while I've been telling my kids and that is not just the story that we read today, but the amount of conversations that can come up from this story um, and the difference that I think the, the story has, the, the potential it has to make a difference in kids' lives. So it's been such a pleasure to be, I, I'm, I'm just honored to be part of this project and to have the, the chance to bring these characters uh, to life through my illustrations. So thank you both for inviting me into your story. So one thing uh, that I want you to talk about, Alina, is that visual illustration is your expertise and your research area. And through Alina's work, I have understood that some of the illustrations that I used to express were speaking louder than some of the stories that I was saying. And sometimes a good visual uh, illustration is so much more powerful. So one of the things that you will notice when you look at the book is powerful colors that Elena uses. And Elena is originally from Colombia where uh, she says it's the land of colors. And uh, all the colors that you're seeing are basically Elena's, uh, they come from Elena's experiences and, and, and in her mind. Um, so before we talk too much about this, there are 
uh, other guests that I want to, to speak with. Uh, Marc-André Girard uh, his, is, a, is a principal at uh, L'Ecole du Triolet in uh, saint Colomban, Quebec. He's here today to talk about uh, his, uh, his experience with, uh, with reading, imagination. He's an expert in innovation in schools. So I'll let him um, give his reflections on, on the, this experience and uh, the seven students who actually read the book in the uh, English as a Second Language class. Well, thank you, um, and Luis, for the invite. Um, we were able to find uh, students here. Um, we're in the French school here in the middle of Quebec, just about an hour north of Montreal. So we had six great students that were um, volunteering to, to join us. So, well, we couldn't make it at the same time because there's a, um, our school is over at, uh, at three and day. We obviously have the, uh, the bus issue. <laughs> so um, we, we had to work something else. So this is why we pre-recorded our uh, interventions. Um, we are a, a school that is based on entrepreneurship, which is uh, leading with uh, projects, uh, but also how to be able to, um, um, uh, like, uh, how can I say that, uh, design thinking. So when you have a problem to find your own solution and to be involved in uh, the solution rather than uh, amplifying the, the, the problem. So for me, it was uh, when, um, I, when um, Anne Louise reached out, I think it was on Twitter, right? Um, I thought it was a good idea to uh, contribute to that project. Um, Maker Spaces is, is something very um, special for me. Uh, I was uh, able with my former team to, in another school to create one of the first uh, Maker Spaces in uh, school, um, in the high school in here in, in Quebec and in, in Canada. So um, uh, I was able to work with uh, students, uh, parents, uh, uh, stakeholders, and obviously uh, teachers to create a, a space that is uh, that has been uh, designed by its user. So basically on a, uh, um, on a um, human scale, um, what is it called? I, for, I forgot the name, the, the lab, uh, when people are part of the solution altogether. Uh, can you help me out with, the, with this? Um, and Louise, remember that? So they can co-construct? Yeah, they can co-construct, but there's a, there's a word for it. It's, uh, in French, it's a uh, laboratoire d'innovation humaine. In English, I, I always say it in English and I forgot it. Um, a living lab or a human innovation. Living lab, lab living lab. So we, uh, we, we design our, um, our space with, um, I would say, human uh, living lab principles. So uh, it was really nice. We all came out together and we were able to create uh, that space. So uh, basically our students who had, uh, um, I don't know, they, were, they, they broke a knob on, uh, some kind of machine or whatever, they were able to replicate it and uh, reprint it to repair themselves instead of throwing things out. So I think it's very important that students are um, empowered to find their own solutions and we give them the means to do so. So basically this is why I was attracted to uh, the, this project and this is why I contributed. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Marc-André, for participating. You're uh, probably one of the most dynamic school principals I've ever met. The energy that you have is fantastic. I don't know where you get the time <laughs> to do these things. Because, uh, for some reason, uh, with all the leadership that you have to, uh, to do in the school and all the additional work that you have to do with the, with the COVID-19 situation, you still uh, found the time to push this. So kudos to you and also kudos to your teacher. Do you want to say a word? Uh, about your teacher as well? Yeah, Marie-Claude, uh, who's uh, actually, he's, she's not there, believe it or not. She got married uh, last weekend, so she's on her, her honeymoon somewhere in Quebec because we're not able to leave the, the province. Uh, she, she, um, so she was not able to make it today. Uh, so she jumped in and she was uh, enthusiastic with that, that project. So uh, it's easy to have leadership. It's easy to have, uh, to show any initiative when you have people who are uh, willing to do it with you. So. Uh, you know, I just gave her the idea and she took care of everything. So uh, I think the, the thumbs up belonged to her more than me. Yes, so thank you uh, to the teacher, much appreciated. Um, we have someone very special today who's a neuropsychologist that I have met while I was studying. Uh, Michelle Bourassa is here today and she, uh, she will talk about uh, imagination and uh, what what our wonderful brain can do when we start imagining things. So Michelle, over to you. Yes, thank you, Anouise. Uh, Anouise just asked me to 
speak about what I know about imagination. So I wrote myself some notes <laughs> so I can be more uh, relevant to the magnificent story you just all read to us. So what I wanted to start with is to let you know, but I'm sure you do know that imagination is part of our daily experience. For example, whenever we're sound asleep and there's a loud boom or something, our heart starts beating and then we wake up and we start listening. That's imagination because we're thinking, okay, we should listen just in order to see if there is something dangerous or not. Or when we start, and maybe it happened to you, crossing a street and we just jump back before even knowing why, till our short-term memory, the memory that's on when somebody speaks, <laughs> Uh, till then our short-term memory plays back the sound or the sight that made us react this way. Our imagination is again at work to save our life. We never stop imagining. We might imagine why this thing happened to us. We might even imagine uh, that there's no hazard or imagine uh, which we what we should do next. Imagination starts as soon as a baby is able to pay attention to the voice, smell, sight of his or her mom, dad, or sibling. His attentive imagination helps him tune in with the emotions of her parent. We're also using our imagination when we feel a connection to the person we're talking to. We speak and tune in to others, but also tune in to ourselves continuously. That's also imagination. We do this, speak to ourselves to remind us of something we shouldn't forget, to make sense of something, or to foresee what we expect and be ready. The children, you do the same. And until you're, or when you're four or even a little younger, when you speak to yourself, you speak out loud. We do the same as adults when we're overly tired or stressed. And we do this speaking out loud to make sure that we're listening to what we're thinking. That kind of imagination helps us understand the world we live in and who, who we want to be in this world. Imagination is at work also when we sleep. Um, we know this when we go to bed with a question and we wake up with the answer the following morning. We know this also when we wake up during the middle of the uh, nightmare. And despite the fact that we know we were just dreaming, we're still in the fear of the dream. Fortunately, when we are children, we can grab our teddy bear, children's sense and trust, their teddy bear's protection, and they are right. Imagination is that powerful. Any novel writer will tell you that he or she listens to the characters, that the words he or she writes come from them. Imagination is in fact a golden route through which everyone, including every child, makes sense of his life. Little Ember, and now I know it's Eliot's idea, used his imagination when he told people that he, he lost her, his arm res, wrestling with a crocodile. When a child says things like this in his child's words, uh, 
he's saying something very important that is not different, that it was something that happened to him. And this is true. When Amber imagines further along the story, the dragon, it helps her again by providing her with the calm and the confidence she needs to feel it, even her fear. And after listening to her mom's idea to discuss this issue with the prosthetist, to start imagining that she has whatever is needed to face this new challenge in her life. I just want to finish with telling you that um, the Senoi of Malaysia, a tribe discovered in, in the 1930s by the anthropologist Kilton Stewart, knew the power of imagination, that tribe. Every morning, adults and children assembled to tell them their dreams and the whole community helped each dreamer to decide what to do with his dream. The Senoi thus learned to transform their dreams into lucid dreams and by doing so to overcome their fear and powerlessness in order to let their inner strength grow together with a sense of belonging to their community. I just want to finish with telling you all, every time you feel like you're losing your faith or strength in your life, bring back your imagination, maybe by listening to John Lennon's Imagine, this song that many of you adults know, or just walking in the woods, staring at the stars or meditating. Imagination is our gift throughout our life. Thank you, uh, Michelle. This was very inspiring. Now you guys uh, all know why I love taking courses with her as a professor when <laughs> she was still the professor at the University of Ottawa. Um, a very, uh, very inspiring speech uh, and, and, uh, and, and good advice as well. Um, so we still have some time to, to hear people's reactions and questions. So one of the things that I'm going to do um, is ask anybody in the audience, uh, either as a, as a panelist or uh, as a spectator, to, to write some questions in the chat box or, or, or impressions, because I'll be reading those uh, after. And while people do this, I'm going to show you uh, some of the questions that some of the children asked that could not be here today. So let me start with Oliver. So this is proving to be a little challenge, but we'll get there. My first question is, how does Amber feel when she gets excluded and bullied by Lana? My second question is, how does 3D printing work in real life? So I'm going to start by showing you what a 3D printer looks like in real life. So I don't know if you can see well what's happening here, but this machine prints objects. And how it works is that there is a plastic filament. It's called, uh, this particular filament is called polylactic acid or PLA. It's a, it's a plastic filament that melts in this area here and it creates an object layer by layer. And those objects can be designed by us. So I will show you what I was doing on the weekend. I needed some lampshades for my working space. And uh, that's what it looks like. So that's what 3D printing looks like in real life. Does anybody want to answer uh, the question of uh, 
how how uh, Amber felt when she was bullied by Lana. Elizabeth, is this something that you want to answer? Sure. Um, so we took from a lot of our, our experience. I think a lot of us have um, struggled with either being different and feeling or feeling very different or even being bullied. So I know in our family, we've had experiences with bullying and it definitely doesn't feel very good, that's for sure. Um, it can be very, very hurtful. It can be, um, it can make you feel like maybe you don't wanna to go to school or you don't want to participate in an activity like Amber didn't wanna go back to swimming. And I think that a lot of us have been there and a lot of us have felt like that. So um, for us, the other part of the story is really important to feel like um, you're taking back ownership over the, over the problem or over the issue and feeling like you are, are strong again is really important after you've been bullied or you felt different or you feel, um, you feel sad about something. It's important to talk to others like Amber talked to her parents. So all of those things are things that, that we've done together as a family too, so. Thank you, Elizabeth. So a lot of people, when they're adults, they realize that, you know, they could have done something when they were younger and they were being bullied, but they didn't know what, and there was nobody to help. So I guess the first thing is to ask for help and tell someone that this is happening. And very often, if you don't say it, then there's nobody to help out. So that's the first thing. Obviously, there's a lot to be done by adults, but um, there's another question coming from uh, the participants who were not here today but let me just share my screen again. How did Yankee disappear? So this question was asked by, by Jad, who is in Lebanon. And I will answer Jad that um, Gentling doesn't disappear. He only went away because he's waiting for part two of Amber the Maker. So you'll have to stay put because Gentling is coming back. I have two questions for you. My first one is, what do you have to study to design a prosthetic limb and, or any other limb? And two, is it harder to live with or without a prosthetic limb? So I think Elizabeth, that might be a question for you again. What do you have to study to design a prosthetic limb? I, best, I guess there are two streams of this, right? There's a prosthetist and an orthotist. So I'll let, I'll let you speak about this. Exactly. So both are definitely specialists that have a lot of specific training and specific learning uh, to be able to do this job. So that's why it's really important uh, that parents and children work with a, a prosthetist and a, an orthotist if, if that is a part of their treatment to be able to design something that works really well but also is really comfortable and does what it needs to do. So the prosthetist is really specially trained to be able to design a prosthetic. So that's why it was really important in the story that we include uh, the prosthetist supporting and helping uh, Amber to create a prosthetic that worked for her. They are really, um, they're the specialists, they're experts in it. Uh, but what I found is that they are really, when we talk about imaginative, they are incredibly imaginative. They are excellent problem solvers and they love to hear from the kids and work with the kids to make something that's really, um, uh, something that's going to work for the child. So they're definitely uh, big on collaboration with the kids. Um, and I think the other question uh, Elliot was going to answer, so is it um, easier or better with a prosthetic versus without? So Elliot uh, wears a prosthetic, he has it here actually, this is his everyday one and it's myoelectric. Uh, so this one is not 3D printed, it's made with his prosthetist, it's a very specialized one. Um, and he has worn a prosthetic since he was about two. So I'll let him talk 
a little bit about that. Do you find there's a big difference between when you wear it or when you don't wear it? I, yeah, there's stuff I can't do and can do with both of them. So it depends on what I want to do if I'm going to wear it with or without it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sometimes it helps that, especially if, uh, if he's feeling a bit tired, it's helpful to wear the prosthetic. So he's less dependent on, on his, uh, what they call the sound arm. So that's his arm that's still a full arm. Um, so that can be a really big help. Sometimes it, it helps a lot in school with writing or reading to be able to hold things. So for those things, it's really very helpful. And something that he <clears throat> uses his prosthetic for, not this one, but a different one, all the time is riding his bike. So as you can imagine, riding his bike would be very challenging without a prosthetic. So it depends on the activity and, and why he's going to wear it, but different prosthetics for different activities are, are very helpful to have. Thank you, uh, Elliot, and thank you, Elizabeth. Ella, did you want to say anything as a, as a big sister? No, thank you. <laughs> did you have any She's comments? Great. She's an incredible big sister and always uh, has been uh, helpful. And she's been at, I think, almost all of his prosthetic appointments since day one. So <laughs> she's been part of the journey since the beginning. Yeah, so the support team, that's great. Uh, as we are, uh, as, as the event was unfolding, we had all sorts of comments uh, coming out. So I can read those, but I can also let the panelists speak if you want. So if you have anything that you want to say, feel free to speak up. Charlotte, was there anything that you want to say with your brother James? Theo, did you have a reaction about the story? I, Charlotte and James had to run off to their next activity, <laughs> tutoring and ballet, but they did love the story. Thank you very much. Awesome. So the, the, the camp siblings in Russell, Ontario, do you have a, a reaction that you'd like to share or a question? I'd like to learn more about 3D printing. Well, it's opened our eyes to 3D printing, which we find very, very cool, and we can't wait to visit it. <laughs> And thank you for including us. It's been a great experience. And well done, Elliot. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Cassandra, did you, was there anything you'd like to say? Any no, I don't have any questions, but thanks for inviting me. Thanks for coming. You've been awesome. Emma, is there anything you'd like to say? Uh, yes, thank you, Elliot, for sharing your story. I find that 3D printing is cool. So Hisham showed up um, a little bit late, but is there anything you'd like to say, Hisham? You'll have to open your mic. Um, yes, I like the, score, the story a lot. Thank you. Awesome. So a few, uh, a few questions that were unfolding as the event was happening. Uh, everybody uh, said, uh, so Carrie says that Elliot is an amazing boy and Ayla is a great big, big sister. And uh, she says that uh, she loves you both. Um, somebody asked if any of the young readers would like to share what you like best about the story. Maybe not now. Somebody said, great team building in this reading activity. And it's interesting because we were a real virtual team. We didn't come together until today. So that's, that's quite impressive. Uh, the Dean said, bravo to all the readers. Vila, uh, who, uh, who is a wonderful uh, art teacher uh, or art educator said, great job kids, excellent reading. 
Nadia Buyan, who's a vice provo uh, at the university, says, you kids are all so amazing. This was the best part of my day. Thank you. And I hope you had fun. And I loved it. There's a lot of kudos there. So listen, thank you so much for, uh, for your participation. I'm going to share my screen one last time so that you can see the names of those who participated. And um, there we go, we'll get there. So these are the names of everybody who participated and uh, the flags are there to represent the countries of those who participated. I want to say thank you to all the children and the parents who took part in this and who gave their time and their energy for reading this story. Uh, it was all very inspiring. Everybody who participated will get, uh, every family will get a copy by mail. I'll have to make sure that I have everybody's address. I put in an online version um, of the book so that you can have access to it for free. So you can flip the book virtually and uh, you'll have access to it right away. I can, I can repost that again. Um, but other than that, uh, it was amazing to have you guys. It was a great event. It's uh, 1657. So I'll hand it over to Anna so she can close uh, the session. Louise, you gave so many thanks, but really it's all of us that have to thank you, uh, not only for the book um, with your collaborators, but also for the tremendous amount of work that you have done to pull this together. I remember we were brainstorming, hey, let's. wouldn't it be cool to do a book launch with a bunch of kids reading the book? And you actually made it happen. So congratulations and thank you to all of our young readers uh, who sent in the recordings as well as everybody who's joined us live here today. All of the special guests that joined and Louise, we really appreciate your time and obviously our audience who are there. Thank you for adding so many supportive comments in the chat. Everybody is really grateful and appreciative of that. A quick reminder that a recording of today Today's event will be available on our website, which is concordia.ca slash four. Um, and it's also live streamed to Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, you can check it out there already now. I've pasted a quick little survey that should take you 30 seconds to a minute uh, to, to complete. If you don't mind, we'd really appreciate your feedback and any further comments you'd have for the organizers about the book, etc. So please go ahead and click on that in the chat. We really appreciate your time. And at this point, I guess I'm wishing everybody uh, bon appétit or uh, good luck with your next activity this evening. I hope you're all keeping well and safe and happy. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future, hopefully further down the line at Concordia proper. We welcome new students. You're never too young to start being interested in university life. So on that note, thanks everybody and have a great evening. Bye. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone. Really, it was amazing. <laughs> it was so much fun to read with you. Thank you to the parents who, uh, who made this happen. It's much appreciated. Michelle, thank you for coming. My pleasure and honor. Elizabeth and Alina will have to speak. Um, we have some media requests, so uh, we'll have to address those tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Uh, Thank you to the Kemp family and Russell. Thank you so much for participating. It was uh, amazing to have you. Olivia, you did a great job with your two brothers. And uh, congratulations, you're an awesome reader. Zachary and, uh, and Tristan, you're, you were awesome as well. Um, and thank you for supporting your little sister in this. All right, we're done. Violet, I